I, I want to talk today um, a little bit about uh, what the new technology has done in opening up a new world for um, those who need information. And I also want to talk first about what the new technology has done that inhibits access to new information by distorting or misrepresenting. <clears throat> and I won't dwell, well, I might dwell, <laughs> on a deeply personal aspect uh -huh. of the problem that, that really makes the point. Uh, and some of you, I, my friends, I look around and see uh, my friends, and <clears throat> know that you know that um, about four years ago I had a little problem with Wikipedia. And I didn't really think it was a problem at the outset. At the outset, I had a call from someone who said, um, Google yourself and hit the Wikipedia link said no more than that, and I Googled and hit the Wikipedia link, and my name popped up. And someone had inserted, without my knowledge, um, certainly without my permission, you don't need permission of anybody to say something about them on Wikipedia or on many websites. But there on this website, someone inserted a six-sentence biography of me. He said in the early 1960s he was administrative assistant to Attorney General Robert Kennedy, true. Went on to say after the deaths of President Kennedy and Attorney General Robert Kennedy, he was the suspect in their assassinations. <laughs> and it said nothing was ever proved. <laughs> He said he then defected to the Soviet Union for 13 years. <laughs> and you know, I did exactly yeah. what you did. I laughed. And then late in the afternoon, um, my son called on the phone. And I said, Dad, you have to take this seriously. You're not the only John Siegenthal in the world. <laughs> He said, I'm John Cena. <laughs> and your grandson Jack is a John Cena dog. And you have to do something to get that down. And so I didn't know enough about Wikipedia except to know that um, it was a very good resource for instant information. And I had been there for quick checks. Um, but suddenly it dawned on me, how could this happen? And I called <clears throat> my friend Brian Lamb uh, in Washington, and he had had uh, an interview just a few days before that I had seen with Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia. And I said, how do you reach him? And he put me in touch with him. I, I called Jimmy Wales in, in St. Petersburg. Jimmy Wales. Um, I mean, it's a genius idea, Wikipedia. Um, he called it intellectual democracy, and I, I have a hard time challenging that, except that if you give access uh, to anonymous sources um, to people all around the world, and Wikipedia had an international reach, it is likely that somebody, given that anonymity, and given the difficulty of tracing that anonymity, will say something bad about somebody. I had no idea who did it. And so I said, Mr. Wales, uh, would you go up with me and look at um, Wikipedia, and let me just take you to this biography under my name, and so he got it up on his screen, I had it up 
Oh, he said, I, I, I don't know enough about you, but I know that's false. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I don't put in the archives where nobody but 1,100 of my editors can read it. <laughs> and I said, I don't want anybody to read. I don't want your editor. He said, look, I have rules of the community. Um, and the rules of the community are the best I can do is put in the archives where my editors can see it. And I said, well, I guess I have to accept that, but would you tell me who did it? He said, I don't have the slightest idea who did it. I don't have any way in the world to know who did it. I can help you with your IP number, your internet protocol number. Now you may not know it if you are on a computer, if you're online, but you have an internet, internet protocol number. I mean, at, at the, uh, I'm sure at the library, it's the same it is at the Seeing Law Center across campus. Um, everybody at, at the Seeing Law Center has the same IP number. Um, and, but if you have an individual computer at home, you have an individual IP number. Um, so the IP number tells you um, what's the name of the online carrier that's doing business with the person who has written um, this biography. And if, in my case, it was <coughs> Bell South. Bell South, I'm delighted to hear that. <laughs> Narrowed the whole world to 12 states. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I, I thought, um, first of all, I thought, you know, I've got enough, <laughs> I'm old, I was 80 at the time, I'm now 84, I said, I've got enough investigative reporting skills <laughs> that I can find out who this SOB is. <laughs> and, um, I thought, first thought was, I'm going to back channel um, Bell South. I mean, I know some people at Bell South. I know some people way up in Bell South. And I called them and I said, look, in strict, absolute confidence, just look this up and give me a hand. <laughs> That's the way journalists do it, you know. I, mean, I said, it's completely off the record. I ain't heard that before. And he said, I'd be glad to call me back in an hour and said, I've talked to our lawyers. I give you that name. I am violating that person's privacy rights. I said, what about my own privacy rights? Yeah, I know. But what you have to do is file a Jane Doe lawsuit or a John Doe lawsuit. This is what my lawyer tells me. File this Jane or John Doe lawsuit in court, and the court will tell El South to tell you. My problem is that, as Connie said, I created a First Amendment Center. <laughs> <laughs> you created a First Amendment Center, are you going to sue somebody the first time they say something bad about you? <laughs> I said, I'm not going to sue. I'm not going to sue anybody. I'm just going to use what skills I have <clears throat> Try to find out. And I'm going to enlist the best reporter I know, my son, to help me find out. And um, we couldn't find out. <laughs> and after a couple of months, I decided the best way I'd address this, I wrote an article, a column, an opinion column, um, on the editorial op-ed page of um, USA Today. Um, I, I had been editorial director and I knew my successor, and my successor was happy to help out with that. And I said in this column that Wikipedia was an unreliable, unfaithful, non credible resource. I acknowledged that it was loaded with great information, but that it was not a credible resource. And that was published. And that attracted the interest of media critics all across the country. The New York Times, Catherine Seeley became interested. 
USA Today decided to pick it up, the Associated Press, a couple of the television networks, they all began to call and say, what about it, what about it? And then they called Jimmy Wales, and he said, look, my rules are anybody can come on anonymously. I don't know who it is. Um, so Jimmy and I got on television a couple of times, and NPR a couple of times, and I don't want to say we yelled at each other, but I was, I did raise my voice a couple of times. I uh, and he was as polite as he could be, but he said, I just don't know. It's against my rules to require people who come to Wikipedia say who they are. Um, the article resulted in literally a flood. A thousand emails, telephone calls, letters. Many of them from people who had been harmed in the same way. Some by Wikipedia, some by other websites. But what finally what finally was impressive to me was the flood of attacks. And some of them came by email personally, but so many of them went back to that biography, which somebody was now rewriting, and the most outrageous, venomous, vicious things you could ever imagine were said about me over the next eight months. The last one, I think, before Jimmy Wales finally put a block on my this new biography, to which I refused to contribute anything, the last person said I'd raped Jacqueline Kennedy. <laughs> not so funny. Uh, but not a thing I could do about it. And then I received a call from a person I never heard of, lives in San Antonio, online guru. He said, I can help you. He said, the same thing happened to me about three years ago, and I started something called Wikipedia Watch. And Wikipedia Watch took cases like mine and posted them. And he said, I believe I can help you. I have researched um, the IP number. I have gone um, to another site, and I have I have found that the person who did this um, did it from a from a business called um, Instant Delivery, Rush Delivery, and he said Rush Delivery is located right in your hometown. So whoever the SOB was, at least he was a local SOB. <laughs> <laughs> On the morning I was on NPR with Jimmy the second time, came back into the office and the lady at the receptionist desk said, a man dropped this letter off for you and I opened it. It was a man named Brian Chase, worked for Rush Delivery. They had fired him that morning, fearing I was gonna sue them. Um, journalists from all over the country had started calling in as soon as I let it be known that Rush Delivery, I had told them all, Rush Delivery is where it originated. And he said, I did it as a joke. Brian Chase was his name. I did it as a joke and they fired me. Just before Christmas. And I went home feeling triumphant, telling my wife, uh, yes, I found the scoundrel and they fired him this morning. And she didn't burst into tears, but she was close, Charlie. She said, it's just before Christmas, you can't let them fire that man. <laughs> <laughs> so I called him back and I said, who employed you? And I called the man and I said, look, I'm sore at him. I don't, I don't like what he did, but it's wrong for you to fire him before Christmas. My wife, Dolores, said so. <laughs> <laughs> and they took him back. Now, Rush Delivery, I know, has since after about three years gone out of business. Um, and I haven't heard from Brian Chase um, since they took him back. Um, but I tell you that story because it demonstrates in the best way I know about my personal encounter with this ingenious idea called Wikipedia. 
Um, but in the process, I found I'm not the only, I'm not the only victim. Many of these people had emailed me, some did not. You may have heard of an African American actor, comedian named Sinbad. Mm -hmm. Name is David Atkins. He's quite good, talented man. But David Atkins has been killed several hundred times. He's alive and well. But they killed him on Wikipedia in, uh, in more ways than I can count on two hands. They, they killed him in a drive-by shooting. They have killed him in a sexual assault in a public bathroom. He has been a suicide victim. Um, he had a heart attack. Um, again, 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 they kill him. Most often they kill him. There's a place on the, his, his biography that they created. Um, it gives his birthday. And death date's a blank, but they fill in that, that death date. Again, again, and again. You know, here's a man who relies on, he relies on um, his visibility to work. And, um, and he's victimized by this, by this online website that is so marvelous in so many ways. And there's another name that might be more familiar to you, Fuzzy Zeller. Fuzzy Zeller is a professional golfer. Years and years and years ago, he won the Masters. Um, he's won many uh, golf tournaments. And Fuzzy is a man with a great sense of humor. Sometimes he lets it get away from him and says things that aren't really funny, but he thought they were before he said them. But, <laughs> but one thing about Fuzzy Zeller, um, he's not a drug addict. He is not an alcoholic. He is not a wife beater. He is not a sexual abuser of children. Fuzzy Zeller's biography on Wikipedia said he was all of those things. And his lawyer called and said, um, what do you do when this happens? And I said, I, I know what you're thinking. Um, I'm not going to encourage you uh, to bring a lawsuit because it is very, very difficult. And he said, well, I'm going to sue Wikipedia. Uh, and he did, and then he found out, then he found out about something called Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. I'm going to come back to Section 230 in a minute. So he files the lawsuit. And the court says, give him the name. And they gave him the name. They gave him the name of a company in Miami. 49 employees. The company said, Mr. Zeller's lawyer, we are so sorry. We don't know anything about this, but we'll help you look for the person who did it. And they did try to find that person. I think they interviewed every employee. But you know, it could have been some visitor in the building, it could have, come, it could have been somebody who came off the street. Because he couldn't find out, and so he dropped, he dropped the suit. I don't know if you remember reading about it at the time, but it was, it was another, it was another, really it was another scandal. But it's not just Wikipedia that misleads online. I'll tell you one more. One more tragic story. There is in California, in Hollywood, an actress whose stage name is Chase Masterson. Chase Masterson, her real name is Carapano. There is in Los Angeles something called Metro Splash. Um, an online entity that had an arm that was called Dating Board. And people who wanted 
date other people, can be on this dating board. And somebody in Germany, an anonymous source, <coughs> put on that dating board specific information on how to reach Chase Masterson uh, addresses, telephone numbers, and she began to get calls from people looking for dates. And some of those calls, quite obviously, were salacious because that posting on dating boards went beyond who she was, beyond the fact that she had been a star on the soaps. I think she was on some of the Star Trek um, programs. It not only defined how to reach her, it invented in a salacious way what her sexual preferences were. And she began to get these calls. And she talked to a lawyer. And she sued <coughs> Metro Splash. And it went, there was a federal suit, and it went to court. And the judge said, and this is really sort of the point, uh, the final point I want to make about people who are harmed by this. The judge used the word reprehensible. As reprehensible, he said, as it was what happened to her. Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act protects online service providers. What the language says is that in matters of defamation, if you're an online service provider, you are protected against libel suits different, the law says, from publishers or speakers. So as I could have been sued when I was a newspaper editor, uh, I could have been sued for saying that about her. Uh, a television station or a network could have been sued. Um, it's protected, the information service protector a provider is protected online. So unless you, she could find out who this anonymous source was in Germany, and she couldn't, um, she had no opportunity to succeed in the lawsuit. And so it was dropped. Court dismissed it, reprehensible, but protected. Now, you know, I'm the First Amendment advocate, and I'm not interested in having Congress uh, pass new libel laws. Every time Congress begins to regulate the media, it goes way too far. Um, some of you won't believe that, but I can tell you, uh, I did not want to go down that road. And my, uh, the reason I'm happy to be here with you today and to talk about this and because of your interest in it, it only reflects a sliver of the opportunity to post vicious, venomous uh, information, uh, false information, plagiarized information. You know, libraries with access to the internet, like newsrooms, they really have the world at their fingertips. That keyboard can take you to places and give you information. Um, in other circumstances, days of yore, you'd have spent hours, weeks, months um, digging for to get accurate information. It's there now. It's there, and the question is, and you have to ask yourself, is it is it a credible is it a credible website? Um, is the blogger honest and honorable and looking to provide straight, truthful, candid information? I mean, what if you're a student and 
professor says, I want an essay on, a, on an African American entertainer. And you say, oh, I'll go to Sunday. I watched him on, on television last week. And you go to Sinbad, dead. You're a journalist, and you have the same assignment. We like a profile on Sinbad, dead. You go back to the editor and say, Sinbad's dead. Hell he is, I saw him on television last week. <laughs> well, if you, saw him on, if you saw him on Wikipedia, you know he's dead. And he's caught in this trap of not being able to answer because day after day after day, somebody answers again and again and again. Um, and as one who went through that and tried to laugh my way through it, um, through some tears that Dolores had, I can tell you that it is, it is a problem. So the great conundrum is this, what do we do? when we have access to this information, literally at our fingertips. I'm working on a biography of a woman named Alice Paul, a suffragist. Been working on it for a couple of years. I will tell you, I can sit there in front of the computer, and I have at my fingertips access to information about her um, that without that information, I'd be here with Connie <laughs> saying, help, help, help. <laughs> And she'd be giving me all the books ever written about suffragists, uh, and I'd be trying to pick and choose what I could find about this little known but heroic woman who went to jail, prison for seven months, who went on hunger strikes um, in prison, was fed in prison by tubes being injected into her nostrils, butter and milk pumped into her body, to keep her alive, put in an insane ward um, by the Wilson administration. Psychiatrist examined Alice and came out and said, look, she's not crazy unless you think it's crazy for women who want to vote. She's the same as, <laughs> as I am. Um, tells you something about, about about history and to have the information at my fingertips, including the 700 word oral history she gave before she died at age 91. Uh, it, it's a marvel, it's a marvelous world this, this new technology has given us. But it's flawed. And those of us who rely on libraries and have traditionally relied on libraries for access to accurate, uh, credible information are caught in this, in this catch-22 trap. Uh, if I go there, is it gonna be, is it gonna be credible? Is it gonna be factual? Um, is it gonna be reliable? Jimmy Wales, at one point, compared <clears throat> facts after I irritated him. Um, <laughs> He had a study done comparing himself to Wikipedia, I, I'm sorry, to the Encyclopedia Britannica. And he found that he was almost as reliable mm -hmm. as Encyclopedia Britannica. But of course, he never considered how much of the content on Wikipedia <laughs> was plagiarized. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I had had enough of it and didn't want to go there. Uh, my friend in San Antonio did a superficial survey and said, yes, plagiarism um, does affect Wikipedia. So it's not just vicious, mean-spirited people, it is also, um, it's also <coughs> they want to say something evil or wicked uh, about you. It is also, it is also, it's also those who are willing to steal the work of somebody else who's playing it for their own now. Now one of the, I'll deal with this very quickly and then I don't want to kind of come late, I don't want to keep you late. I, I just would ask you to 
think for a moment about WikiLeaks. Um, WikiLeaks dropped bombshells on the world. Um, um, creator of WikiLeaks got asset access to um, information, government information, classified information, top secret information, information about American interactions with people around the world. And much of it, most of it, is just dead, solid, accurate. Um, which tells you something else about this wonderful new technology, this marvelous new technology. Um, government secrets are not easily kept. <laughs> now there's a problem with that if you look at Rupert Murdoch and his son James in England, had a crew of reporters who'd hack into your telephone, hack into your computer, um, and go with information that was deeply personal, uh, often scandalous, and I dare say sometimes inaccurate. The point of it is particularly for those um, who love libraries, who work in libraries, who want to protect the integrity of libraries, is to remember that those computers that are available to People who use libraries are fallible. Uh, they can be misused as, all, as well as used to discover the oneness of the world. Um, they can ruin you. Um, they can mislead the people who come to libraries for information. And you know, there's going to be, at some point, there is going to be a movement to regulate information online. It's inevitable. You can't find, you can't, you can't find out about me on Wikipedia now, I don't think. But let me tell you, you can't find out about George Bush or Barack Obama. What happened to me is superficial stuff compared to what is delivered to politicians. And my fear is that when enough politicians are damaged by it and feel it, um, in a scandalized by and find out they've got no right to sue, there's going to be a change in the law. And as I say, I fear those regulations. I always find from Gutenberg, um, from Gutenberg until Microsoft, um, every effort at regulation um, is, is in some way a step beyond what's needed to protect the information and the public. So the bottom line I come away with is that there's an awful lot of there's an awful lot of information out there online that's not part of the wonderful world with your fingertips. Um, if I were advising uh, people who who go online, and my grandson does, in order to study, uh, or to research, or to write. Uh, and so many people use libraries uh, for that, those very things. I would say there's always a second source, always a third source. Uh, and if you're still in doubt, there's a fourth source. And in this library, at that keyboard, they're all right there at your fingertips. Um, I'll close with with a uh, with a quotation. You know, I love when I talk about First Amendment issues, and clearly this is one. I love to quote Thomas Jefferson or James Madison, our most elegant and eloquent spokesman for our rights of. But there's another founder, um, one not much 
identified uh, with rights of free expression. And he pointed uh, out, um, he said, as they were in the Constitution Convention, uh, he stood and he said, whatever fine words, and I'm paraphrasing only slightly, um, whatever fine words are inserted into a Constitution. And then he's talking about freedom of the press. He says, it always must depend on the general spirit of the people, on public opinion, he said, and the general spirit of the people and the government. Now what he's warning is that you can, you can go the direction Jefferson and Madison said you should go. Um, and if you do, there'll be violations. There'll be wrongs done. People will be slandered. People will be insulted. People will be wrong. Um, and what you'll do, and it was with this in mind, and his words in mind, that had a major role when we started the First Amendment here at the center here at Vanderbilt. What he is saying is that if you go there, you always must worry about public opinion <coughs> and the spirit of the people and the government. And I must say there most of my life, as I looked at public opinion and the general spirit of the people and the government, I worried about about maybe losing at some point those for the First Amendment rights uh, and values. And I look today at libraries and, and, and once again I recognize, and we all must recognize, um, that we must take every advantage of the one world of the media. And as we do it, we must be well aware um, that as we gain knowledge, we can also be undermined by waves of false information. Some of it not fit for your garbage pail. Thank you very much. Some of it's wrong in a way that, that, that somebody ought to correct because it projects my role, role uh, in a rather heroic way. <laughs> and I should, as a matter of conscience, go in there and downplay that and give the credit where it belongs to those brave young people 
who literally risked their lives, but I'm just not willing to play their game, to play Jimmy's game. And so I did not go in and correct it, but the answer is yes, I could have. The problem is that the day I corrected it, it's going to be re it's going to be re damaged the next next day by the dozens of people. I just tell you one interesting. He said he had editors. They've got these these servers. So every time there's a new entry on Wikipedia, he's got one of those. They're more than 1,100 now. Who can go in there? In that first draft of my biography. And, and I told you John C. Cole was administrative assistant to Attorney General Robert Kennedy in the early 1960s. Well, he had somebody watching. And there was an error. Brian Chase, who wrote that stuff, misspelled the word early. He spelled it E-A-L-R-Y. And the editor caught it and corrected it. He <laughs> left him there as an assassin and a defector. So I... I, I decided I wouldn't play the game, but yes, Wikipedia rules did and do give you the opportunity to go in and say whatever you want to say, but they don't stop somebody else from coming back the next day and just putting it right back the way it was, or worse. Charlie. I can put a virus on your computer that gives me access, and then I can put a statement that comes from your IP address. <laughs> Say it in the microphone, Charlie. Everybody ought, to, everybody ought to hear from a real technology expert. I said, I can put a virus in your computer that gives me access to it, and then I can send anything I want as your statement with your IP address to anybody I want to. And as Charlie Rue says, that takes the deception another step away from, from reality and makes the correction even more difficult. I'm borderline impossible in those yeah. circumstances. What's identity theft? Yeah. And I, I you know, and I, I, I recited cases here that suggest that I'm hostile to the new technology. I'm not. I use it every day. I love it. But I love it, you know, it's not equal love. I, I love what, I, what is the best of it, uh, of access. Uh, it gives me what I need, what I, what I, not just what I want, what I need. On the other hand, it also gives me access to that which damages so many others uh, and damages so many of them without even their knowledge of it. That's the catch 22. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you've just about listened to me to death, and I really appreciate the opportunity out here. Is there some? Oh, yeah. Pat. And, and, and this gentleman uh, um, I just had a quick question about um, something that happened at Vanderbilt recently. Um, over the, I think this past summer they implemented this new feature on the Vanderbilt website called the Free Speech Zone. Um, but um, there are actually three rules on this Free Speech Zone. Um, they are no organized crime, no paid advertisements, and no hate speech. Um, I particularly have a problem with the no hate speech rule, and I was curious to um, hear if you had an opinion on that. Well, you know, I particularly have a problem with any hate speech rule. I, I, you know, I, I think hate speech laws are really um, a bit dicey. Uh, you know, I, I think, I think uh, people were damaged before the legislatures put the word hate in front of speech. They were, they were damaged by uh, vicious, venomous speech. Um, I'd have a hard time identifying what was said about me as hate speech, although with regard to Fuzzy um, and, and Sinbad, considering who did it to them, I uh, will never know. Uh, I think, I, I, I don't think calling that hate speech um, helps it at all. And so I, I, I have a real problem with the whole issue of hate speech. You know, I think free expression ought to give you the opportunity to say what you think. And I don't want to get caught in some conflict with Vanderbilt about a First Amendment issue when I've got a First Amendment center on the campus. <laughs> but if somebody asks me, as you just did, I'll tell them what I, what I think. And I appreciate the, the question. I think. 
<laughs> it is so refreshing to hear somebody champion the general spirit of the people again. And our friend Barry Friedman has done it in terms of the Supreme Court decisions, and now you've done it on technology. Thank you. Well, thank you, Pat. And thank all of you for coming today. I enjoyed very much Connie asking me. I, I talked about Wikipedia, WikiLeaks. I didn't get to Wiccans, but <laughs> everybody knows what a Wiccan is. And I look back over my life, some of my best dates were Wiccans. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here with us. Before we continue the conversation uh, over uh, the reception, during the reception, uh, I, if I can uh, secure John's permission, on behalf of the staff of the libraries at Vanderbilt, we would like to add a book in your honor to commemorate today. This is a book from 1830 to our special collections. And it's called A Treatise on Law of Libel and the Liberty of the Press, showing the origin, use, and abuse of the law of libel written by a college president. Uh, and I won't go on because I know you want to get to the reception and to talk with John, but we can discuss that later. But if you allow us, we'd like to commemorate the occasion with the edition oh, of this book. Honor. Every time I come here, you honor me with something else. <laughs> <laughs> well, you. many of you know that we are very honored because John has announced that his papers will be at Vanderbilt's libraries. And <laughs> we, uh, we have offered regularly to go help with that, and uh, we look forward to the day when they arrive in our, our collections. I hope you'll join us on the second floor in the gallery for a reception, and uh, let's thank John one more time, because that was really wonderful. <laughs>